Many of us in our respective fields often work with objects, artifacts, and manuscripts emanating from different cultures and regions of the world. But we rarely ask ourselves the following two questions. Why am I able to access this source and why is it here? Our next speaker, who I am very honored to introduce, reminds us that just like people, objects and artifacts also have histories of their own. Dr. Hegnar Zetlian Wadenbaugh is professor of art history at the University of California, Davis. Her research focuses on art and architectural history in the Middle East, gender and space, architectural preservation, in addition to the history of museums and the politics of heritage. She is a prominent speaker and writer on Armenian and Middle Eastern cultural heritage and the author of two award-winning books, The Image of an Ottoman City, Imperial Architecture and Urban Experience in Aleppo in the 16th and 17th centuries, and The Missing Pages, The Modern Life of a Medieval Manuscript from Genocide to Justice published by Stanford University Press last year. Her second book, the first to receive prizes from both the Society of Armenian Studies and the Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association, retraces the journey and history of the Zaytun Gospels, a medieval Armenian manuscript and its missing pages found at the Getty Museum at Los Angeles, from their production to their legal battle. It explains how the life and story of this manuscript uncovers the, the history and struggles of the Armenian people. Through her work, Dr. Wattenbaugh invites us to reconsider our perception of these objects based on their own experiences and histories that sometimes include looting, illicit transmission, and destruction, leading us to rethink who should own heritage, how should objects found outside their own modern geographical regions or nations be presented ethically in museums and exhibits, and most importantly, what is the relation between human rights and the restitution of cultural heritage? So please help me in welcoming Dr. Hegnar Zetlian Wadenpa. Hi, thank you so much. Um, can you hear me? Thank you so much, Maroon, for that generous introduction. Um, and thank you um, uh, for inviting me. I am um, trying to share my screen, Jennifer. Um, oh, here we go. Um, it is um, okay. It is um, such an honor for me to be on the same panel as two scholars whose work I have admired for years and that my students have been reading and commenting on and learning from for years. So Patty is wonderful to meet you virtually and Ash, it's so wonderful to see you again after so many years. Um, so as uh, Maroon described, I came into these issues when I began to follow a particular um, conflict between the Armenian church in Los Angeles and the Getty Museum over a fragment of a medieval manuscript, the canon tables from the Zaytun Gospels, that had come into the Getty's um, uh, art collection in 1994. And this was my point of entry into these uh, kinds of issues. And so as the only art historian on this panel, um, what I'll contribute is um, uh, some sense of how the art history as a discipline has approached these issues. What are some of the problems with art history's approaches? Um, and what are some of the debates that are ongoing at this time? Um, so the first uh, point I want to make is, uh, because I'm an art historian, I have to begin with the object. And the first point is that manuscripts are a very interesting and unique type of object. They are... Um, uh, they are by definition composites. They have a material support, which is parchment or paper, already a highly processed product. They include text, uh, semantic content presented through the medium of writing. They have beautiful writing or calligraphy. Um, manuscripts uh, can also include other kinds of aesthetic elaborations, such as oh, ornament, narrative painting, and so on. And manuscripts, of course, also include bindings. And each of these components has a different inter interpretive needs, different conservation needs. And as in the case of this uh, 15th century manuscript uh, today in Cairo, uh, the different components can also date to different periods and have very different histories. Um, the 
other uh, point I want to make is that um, um, the notion that uh, manuscripts, uh, especially beautiful illuminated manuscripts and luxury manuscripts are works of art and belong in museums is a very recent phenomenon. And the very notion of art with a big A is also a phenomenon that um, has to do with the rise of modernity. Um, so the concept of manuscripts such as this, such as the Zaytun Gospels, were not created as works of art. They were not born works of art. They became works of art um, in the period of modernity. Um, so what do I mean is that um, a manuscript such as the Zaytun Gospels, when it was created, was understood to be um, what the Armenian tradition calls a breath of God. Um, it, it is the name that Armenians give to Bibles. It was an object that had power because of the words that it contained, uh, the words of um, uh, inspired by God in the Bibles. It, uh, its aesthetic elaboration, the work of illuminators and, uh, and painters enhanced its qualities. But the most important thing was that it contained the word of, of God. And a manuscript like the Zaytun Gospels had its own agency. It was not an inert object. It was not a static object, but it was almost a living being. It was an object that did things in the world. It performed miracles. It extended protection to its people. It could also punish enemies. So it was a it, it's a notion of the object as a shaper of the world, not as an inert or passive or even stable object that can be approached and understood and is always equal to itself. Uh, so this power for the Zaytun Gospels had nothing to do with its illumination or its artwork, uh, but rather, um, and because of that, uh, very few people actually had the had uh, were entitled to see its aesthetic qualities. The people um, who um, lived in the town of Saytun, where this manuscript spent several hundred years of its life, and after which it is named. Um, Knew, would have known of the existence of the Zaytun Gospels and would have seen it as a closed, glittering object that would be raised by a priest above the congregation on specific dates in the liturgical calendar or doing great stresses in historical times. Um, over the course of the time, the three centuries that uh, the Zaytun Gospels spent in Zaytun, very few people got to open its pages and to look at its, or its uh, paintings that are so valued today. So what art historians value about objects and their aesthetic qualities are not what the people who would have used this object as um, part of their religious uh, universe would have valued. Those were two different and perhaps incompatible things. Uh, the current debates in art history focus on the materiality of objects, uh, things like thing theory, that focus on the ways in which uh, art objects intervene in the world and have power. Another debate within art history that I uh, was inspired by and drew upon in my own work was the idea that uh, that comes from anthropology and from figures like Igor Kopitov and Alfred Gell is the idea that um, art objects, manuscripts have biographies, they have social lives and even political lives and uh, religious lives that extend from the moment of their creation and their coming into the world all the way into the present. And these various periods of the object's biography have an impact both on the object's own materiality and on its interaction uh, with the humans and the various communities that surround it. Another uh, important point um, that I learned about the Zaytun Gospels is that um, it, it, it consists in, and the those of you, uh, those who among you who study manuscripts and their various components will know very well, is the colophon. Uh, the colophon or Hishadagaran in Armenian 
um, is a text that is appended to the main text of a manuscript that uh, is of, of the first colophon is often written by the creator of the manuscript. And it describes the, um, the circumstances of the creation of the work, something about the patron, uh, historic circumstances, the name of the painter is often mentioned in this case. The painter Toros Rostin has signed his own name and he says a few things about himself. But um, one of the ways in which these types of manuscripts were not inert objects is that over time, special people in the community, namely priests, would uh, would manipulate the object and add to it later colophones. What you're, what I'm sharing with you on the screen is a page from uh, the Zaytun Gospels that shows you different kinds of hands, some of them different kinds of handwriting, some of them separated by lines. These are the later colophones that uh, that record notations um, uh, of by people that have been added to the manuscript long after its moment of creation. And so in this way, the Zaytun Gospels also became a repository of the memory of the various communities where it resided. And these communities interacted with the manuscript by um, imprinting their own ideas and thoughts and concerns and hopes within the manuscript itself. So this is yet another way in which these types of works are um, active uh, and uh, they respond to the needs of their com community. So to conceive of them not as static objects of aesthetic appreciation, but rather as participants in shaping the history of their community. Manuscripts, of course, are portable objects, uh, unlike sites. And even though uh, they are um, so associated with places, in the case of the Zaytun Gospels, we know that it was kept in the church that was on the citadel of Zaytun, which is what you see on the screen. I have not been able to find a photograph of this church, and outsiders who visited it described it as um, architecturally unremarkable and even ugly, but religious experiences of great intensity took place in this church that enhanced by objects of great antiquity, such as the Zaytun Gospels. So once the Zaytun Gospels was embedded in this space, in this very particular spatial context, but what, uh, in this case, uh, once that spatial context um, oh, crumbled as a result of the Armenian genocide, uh, the object was set into movement, into migration, to use the term that you're using in your lab. Um, so manuscripts are embedded in architectural sites, they are embedded in spatial contexts, but they are also independent from them and they can be set onto, they, they can move and go to different kinds of places where they will be remade into objects that have different functions um, and interact with different kinds of communities. Uh, many times, and it is the case of the Zaytun Gospels, this type of migration was directly impacted by circumstances of war, conflict, genocide, violence. Um, and this brings us to troubled issues of restitution and tensions over the object. Um, and the whole issue of provenance and how to deal with it. So what I'm showing you on the screen is um, two versions of the, even the canon tables from the Zaytun Gospels that are preserved today at the Getty Museum. Uh, in 1995, when the museum had just acquired uh, the canon tables, this was the provenance that they gave. And in 2006, when the lawsuit um, that the Armenian church had brought against them had been settled um, by agreement, the museum presented this new provenance. So 
what has happened between these two moments in time? And how does provenance, this very art historical textual genre that consists of a series of terse entries that records changes in ownership, how does that participate in differentials of power and power struggles and all kinds of other kinds of issues that characterize 21st century art history? And here I'll quote a wonderful um, term from Anne Igone, um, the art historian um, who says of uh, provenance lists, quote, so many epic tales compressed into such dry lists. And I find um, this a really evocative way of talking about how provenance as a textual form purports to record facts about a manuscript, but it is uh, how it raises the issues of how are facts introduced? Who gets to define what is an acceptable fact and what is not? Um, how are such facts established? Who resists them and how? Uh, in this case, provenance was changed as one of the results of the litigation, yet that is not reflected in the, pro in, in the, in, in the presentation of the provenance. Um, provenance can be a way of establishing or reestablishing a truth about a manuscript that was previously trafficked or stolen or spirited away, but it can also be a way to paper over or whitewash or minimize such events in the life of a manuscript. One of the key issues that I encountered and many others have encountered as well in trying to compile um, uh, provenance and understand it, its full uh, dimension is that we have what um, social scientists would call data asymmetry. Um, it is not always easy to find the kinds of documents that pass muster in the kind of research that art historians must do. And especially persecuted groups, groups that have been, um, uh, that, that have had to be transferred, populations that have, had, have been transferred, populations that have been subjected to violence, libraries that have burned, all of these factors um, conspire to create a situation where evidence, especially textual evidence, may no longer be in existence. Time may have passed and living people are not available to answer questions. And so when presenting claims about manuscripts and in presenting their version of, uh, of provenance, uh, certain parties are always going to be at a disadvantage and powerful institutions are going to be at an advantage. Another issue is, and this comes in, uh, into play in litigation and the kind of litigation that was involved here, which was civil litigation, um, is the issue of wealth. And as art historians, we don't like to talk about the role of the art market or the role of money, but it is present everywhere and it impacts uh, the practice of art history and the practice of museums. Um, as um, the legal scholar Michael Basler has said about uh, the Holocaust restitution movement, he has characterized it as rich man's justice in, in the sense that this is civil litigation and in order to bring these kinds of lawsuits, you need to be able to afford it. And that speaks, that's yet another way in which differentials of power are very apparent. Um, the Getty Museum is the uh, world's wealthiest art institution. Uh, and here the Armenian church, it's a mid-level religious institution in Los Angeles. The differential of resources is very stark. So um, it, it, this really inflects uh, the, the questions of who gets to sue who can afford to sue, even if the law favors you, can you afford to undertake costly and risky litigation? And that raises the question of who is going to speak for objects that are trafficked or about whom questions can be raised? Who takes up their interests and who takes up the interests of the communities, in this case, the faith communities, uh, for whom this object is still a religious and devotional object, not just a work of art. 
And this brings me to the issue of uh, the approach of art history to objects such as this. Um, in art history, and I'm showing you um, one um, element of uh, one piece of the um, uh, eight pages um, that of the canon tables that are at the Getty today uh, on exhibition. And we see on the screen, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Morrison, the curator of manuscripts at the Getty, who is a um, you know, fantastic scholar of medieval manuscripts and um, um, uh, extremely supportive um, um, uh, person in my, in my research. Um, and so she here, uh, we're seeing a special visit uh, to the, uh, to, to the canon tables on exhibition by Archbishop uh, Mardi Rossian of the Western Prelacy of the Armenian Church. He's the man with the purple shirt and various other um, uh, leaders of the, of the Armenian community in Los Angeles. Um, so museology does, does not, uh, the museum presentation of objects and art history generally do not prioritize the social life of objects. Provenance is an important tool of art history, but most of the time we tend to relegate provenance to the archives and object files. We do not put it on display in museum exhibitions. Um, it is only recently that historians have begun to think very thoughtfully and very deeply about provenance as an, an alternate history of art, which is part of the title, subtitle of a recent book. So the stories of the social life of objects that may include uh, traumatic experiences are usually not told in exhibitions. Uh, art museums approach um, uh, manuscripts, especially beautiful manuscripts that have aesthetic qualities and paintings and ornamentation and calligraphy, we, uh, it, it, um, art museums in particular, see them as aesthetic objects that are there for contemplation, for admiration, for edification. Um, Art exhibitions that include manuscripts such as this will, of, will often emphasize the moment of creation of the manuscript and they will uh, present a very thoughtful stories about the, the artistry of Toros Roslin and the creation of the manuscripts, the relationship of his style to the style of other um, artists, the importance of uh, the cultural encounters uh, in, the, in the dissemination of artistic ideas. Um, and the Getty has done a number of very innovative and very interesting uh, exhibitions in recent years where they have showcased the Zaytun Gospels. But these types of uh, exhibitions, as important as they are, as interesting as they are, tend to privilege the art aspect of such manuscripts, not their social lives and uh, their the, the complexities of their provenance. It is only recently that some art museums and some curators have begun to experiment with provenance as a subject of exhibition in and of itself. Um, and many of these uh, innovations in curatorship have come from curators in Germany um, who are especially interested in highlighting and problematizing issues of um, the pro the episodes in the provenance of the manuscript where they had passed through Nazi hands and sort of tell the history of that troubled uh, episode in the history of European art. Um, one other additional point I want to make is about the agency of display. Um, what happens, uh, the, the agency of display is the notion that when uh, an object is presented, it's exhibited in a particular way, that changes the way it is perceived, it changes the way it is understood, and it can even predetermine the way in which it can be understood. Um, and so, uh, the agency of display in an art museum context will present the artwork in a very particular way. And in the case of manuscripts, of course, um, there is nothing neutral about the exhibition of a manuscript in an art museum. And curators have to answer many questions. 
do um, are they to present a manuscript closed so that we can only see its binding or open? If they will present the work open, will it, which page will they choose for exhibition? And if they choose to exhibit it open, will they present it in such a way that mimics the traditional way in which people would have approached these manuscripts? Or will it place it on or behind a glass case and in some cases provide uh, magnifying glasses in order to make it easier uh, to see the, the details, uh, especially of miniatures? So all of these decisions affect the way in which the object is experienced um, on the exhibit. In the case of the canon tables that are at the uh, that are um, in the um, at the Getty Museum, I want to make one final point about the way in which its exhibition transforms the way we understand it. The Getty has, this is a diagram of the section of the manuscript that the Getty has. The Getty has essentially uh, four bifolia, that means four sheets of parchment, which when folded in a particular way, um, uh, prescribed, of course, by the creators of the manuscripts, uh, would have yielded four uh, sets, four pairs of facing pages. And so this is how the artists and the creators of the manuscript would have wanted us to encounter these canon tables. This is the first matching set, the second matching set, the third matching set, and the fourth matching set. So you see that in each case, the two facing pages are almost identical, not quite. Our eye is meant to travel from one um, side of the painting, one page to the other, like a very refined spot, the differences puzzle. These subtle differences and the echoes between the two pages were part of the artistry of canon tables. Canon tables, um, as you see, they are a series of arches within which are these grids that contain uh, letters of the Armenian alphabet. Letters of the Armenian alphabet also stand for numbers. So what we're seeing here is an index or an Excel sheet, a concordance list that lists uh, where the same event occurs in two or more of the gospels. Canon tables were an essential part of medieval gospels and they were often um, the medieval gospels most decorated, most aesthetically enhanced um, elements. So these were the matching sets. However, the Getty, um, and rightfully so, can only exhibit these, um, uh, uh, these uh, uh, sheets of parchment as the building blocks of a book that they actually are. And so when we see uh, the canon tables on exhibition, we will see two facing pages. However, these are not the matching sets. The artist would have not intended us to view these two pages together. So the experience of seeing these objects on display in an art museum today is very different from the intended um, experience um, of seeing them in a book. It's a very, it has become physically a very different kind of object. And I'll conclude with one point. Um, I don't know if it's visible here in this uh, photograph, but there is a horizontal line, which is a crease. And here is uh, not a very good photo of um, uh, cannon tables on exhibition. And here you will see this crease that is visible in the middle of the pages. This is not, uh, this is part of the experiences of this object that, um, uh, that have become imprinted on it physically. Um, the more I visited this object at the Getty, the more it seemed to me that this crease was a very important part of its materiality and its history that demanded a certain kind of attention. 
um, they, even though the Getty Museum has one of the world's, if not the world's very best conservation institute, um, and they have taken great care of this object, um, nothing will smooth out this crease. And I came to see this crease as a scar, as um, a phenomenon that marked the moment when the the canon tables were removed from the mother manuscript when someone folded them and took them away. And when they became a fragment, the pages became a fragment. They were no part of the manuscript, but were fragments of a manuscript. And these, um, and it is for this reason that I conceive of objects like the canon tables as survivor objects objects that have undergone traumatic experiences along with the communities uh, for which they are religious objects to whom they belong and with whom they have spent many centuries. Um, survivor objects connect us to the past in a very powerful way and they also demand very specific ethical, um, they make very specific ethical demands on us as our historians, as curators, but also as viewers um, and as lovers of art um, and cultural heritage. So I will, um, it, I'll make one final point about the survivor objects. Um, and this has to do with the destruction of culture that uh, Patty and Andras have um, uh, already referred to. One of the reasons why the canon tables at the Getty are so important and hold such a crucial symbolic uh, space for Armenians, it is because um, they are very rare remnant. Uh, of the religious and cultural heritage of Armenians in the former Ottoman Empire that was almost completely destroyed during the Armenian genocide. To sort of signify this idea of destruction, I am showing you the monastery of St. John, which was the most important Armenian religious shrine in the Ottoman Empire. And it was destroyed, um, these are before and after pictures from the Library of Congress, and it was destroyed in 1916. So most of the cultural heritage of Armenians um, in the Ottoman Empire met the fate that you see on the screen. Um, of all the treasures and manuscripts and icons and vestments and liturgical objects that exist existed in Zaytun itself and the monastic life in its surroundings, the Zaytun Gospels is the only object that has survived. So a survivor object like the Zaytun Gospels stands not only for itself, but it also stands for everything that has been lost and that will never be retrieved. Um, and I will stop there. Thank you so much.